So anytime. Yeah. Okay, so you're, you're doing the ingredients. No. Uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and and you're oh, no, I've got I've got some Sir James Hodge to come and open the uh, special lecture by Sir Harry Grotto. Sir James, please.
to celebrate the establishment of, of that new university. And we have, of course, the, uh, uh, the Vice Chancellor here also, as Carol. This exciting project has been under development for just about three years. It is now being realised on a greenfield site overlooking the sea and John Tien Beach. I think the site has been extremely well chosen, about 120 kilometres from Bangkok and within easy striking distance of the main urban and industrial areas of the eastern seaboard industrial development zone. About 10 months ago, I had the privilege uh, of attending the ceremony uh, to lay the foundation stone for AUST, which was uh, presided over and graciously conducted by Her Royal Highness Princess Mahachakri Sundong. The project, a major Thai initiative, and has, involved, and has involved collaboration with the Imperial College of Science, Technology and Medicine at London University, and has enjoyed the personal support of Imperial's rector, uh, Sir Ron Oxborough. AUST is a truly international university, uh, but I'm delighted that it is to be modelled on Imperial College, which, as I've already said, is very much involved in the development of AUST, and which will also ensure its academic standards and qualifications. The UK is, I think, rightly admired for the excellence and quality of its higher education, qualification, and an improved supply of well-qualified and motivated young scientists and engineers have been identified by the Thai government as a prerequisite for the further economic development of this country. Education, of course, plays an important role in the relations between Thailand and the United Kingdom. And this collaboration that I've described between AUST and Imperial College, although it is one of the more ambitious, is by no means the only project currently underway. Others involve the establishment of independent schools in Thailand, others the joint development of courses in Thai universities, while another university project is currently under discussion. So much for the general, now to the particular. It's my great pleasure to introduce to you our distinguished speaker for this morning's lecture, Professor Sir Harry Croto, FRS. Born in the UK, uh, Sir Harry graduated from Sheffield University and also took a PhD in chemistry there. After further research with the National Research Council in Canada and Bell Laboratories in the United States, he began his academic career at the University of Sussex in 1967. He became a full professor in 1985 and was elected a fellow of the Royal Society in 1990. Sir Harry has been a key figure in the establishment of a completely new branch of chemistry. I suppose I'd better interject here to say that as someone whose chemical education ended with Scottish fires about 35 years ago, um, I'm now on, shall I say, slightly uncertain ground. Uh, I rely upon words which others have told me, but I'm sure they're not absolutely right. His work in the new forms of carbon he has discovered has caught the imagination of other scientists and of the public. This new class of carbon compounds is said to have shifted the carbon paradigm, thus shaping radically our understanding of carbon. The structures of these compounds are both surprising and aesthetically pleasing. The first of the compounds to be characterized, Buckminster Fullery, is a sphere of 60 carbon atoms it looks very much like a football that lasts something I can identify with, which no doubt enhances their initial appeal to the public. Also, the playful christening of buckyballs is for the most part a little easier uh, to remember. I'm glad to see that science does include some humor as well. Um, the new class of carbon structures is not some, simply some scientific oddity, however. Its study has established a whole new branch of chemistry with more exotic carbon structures and a more profound understanding of carbon, carbon bonding. So Harold's work, which began in the seemingly esoteric area of intercellular chemistry, has truly opened a new door to our understanding of the world of science. In 1996, uh, Professor Croto and his collaborators Robert Curl and Richard Smalley were awarded the Nobel Prize for Chemistry for their novel and remarkable discovery. Professor Crowther was also knighted that year by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth for his services to science. The story of the Fullerenes is a classic example of a brilliant scientific endeavor involving collaboration, competition, devotion, 
as well as some good fortune. I look forward very much, as I know you all do, to hearing more about the progress of this research. And I invite you now, please, to welcome Professor Sir Harry Critter. Plato 
devised the periodic table of the Greeks. And we had five elements. You can sit down to a in those days, and only five elements. Um, and this were earth, fire, water, and air. And then, one day, Hippasus, in 546 BC, discovered the dodecahedron. And he was so happy and excited, he went around his friends and boasted and bragged and said, I've discovered this fantastic thing. And his colleagues weren't so happy with boasting, they decided to drown him. So here's a lesson for everyone if you discover something. Just don't be too talking about it. Now, it seems to me that this statement of um, Plato is a very powerful statement. And when I became a, a spectroscopist, I found something and in the work of Van Fleck. Now, Van Fleck is basically one of the major scientists of this century. And it says here, Practically everyone knows that the components of total angular momentum of the molecule relative x, y, z fixed in space satisfy, satisfy the computation relationship of this form. Now, I was in Chiang Mai, and I went to the night bazaar, and I asked everybody at the night bazaar whether they knew this. <laughs> and not a single person knew that this was correct. So I thought, well, if Van Fleck says this, I better learn. Because by the time I finish, you will really understand this. Anyway, if you want to understand this, angular momentum is what essentially Newton understood in, to try to interpret the way that Halley's comet came about. Okay? If you want to understand the way the electron moves around the nucleus, then you have to go into this. You know, well, the reason I show you this is because I think it's beautiful. When I walk around Bangkok and see the script, I think it's just useful see the writing. Somehow in our writing is our culture. And in this beautiful page is, is Dirac's treatment of angular momentum. And if you go through this calculation, which take, took me a long time, and I couldn't do it for, until I I've learned a fair amount of mathematics, it tells you how a photon interacts with matter. It tells us how light from the sun is emitted, and how it is absorbed by the eye. It is how it bounded up with this, which is the angular momentum rules. And a very simple one is that J, when J is zero, there are two J plus one components. So this number gives you, put J to zero equal here, we get one. If you put one into this, we get three. If we put two into this, we get five. And then we end up with one, three, and five, which is, again, it's the periodic table. And deep down in there is symmetry. The symmetry of the cube, the symmetry of an icosity, the symmetry of the cube. So ultimately, symmetry is basic not only to science, not only to chemistry, but also to poetry, to music, to the way we see. And somehow that's the reason why this molecule somehow is so beautiful. It's about as symmetric as you can get. And so I wanted that to be the start of what I would like to say. Now my lecture is in three parts. And if there's anything you want to understand, then you go to translate and I'm um, happy. So the first part will be an introduction, and that's the first part of the introduction. Now, on the basis of that, you end up with a pattern like this, which is a design that I did many years ago for a conference. Now, those of you are chemists, recognize that as a periodic table. And, okay, it's in focus. Um, and this is, um, if you show that pattern to someone on another planet, on the other side of the galaxy, if they had done chemistry, they would recognize it. They don't need to know the language. And so in this, we see the language of chemistry. And it would be not only international, but intergalactic. Because if they'd done chemistry, they would look at that pattern and they would realize these are the patterns of the elements. Okay. So I want to now just mention that because I'll come back to that. That the science, that science has its language. And to understand it, you have to learn the language. In some cases, symbolism. In other cases, mathematics. Right. I'd like now to go.
this. Let me take my jacket off as well. Okay. Anyone who knows me knows that I can't sleep. I never end up, I don't usually take all my clothes off in the lecture, but I do take some of them off. Um, let me, I guess Professor Grotto would like to show another symmetry. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, Bip and I have been sharing jokes all weekend. Okay. Uh, uh, let me go now to chemistry. And I think it's important, as we reach the 21st century, to realize that the youngsters here have got some problems to solve. And they've got to be smarter than we, are, we were, right? We, uh, some of the created new compositions of matter have transformed to an even greater extent in the modern world. New metals, plastics, composites, textiles, adhesive, coatings, rubbers, insulators, conductors, semiconductors, superconductors, optical fibers, detergents, ceramics. The list is much longer than this, and chemists created the material of them all. A physicist, a mathematician, a biologist, or an earth scientist, that is what they are there for. To an increasing extent, this majority is insisting that scientists ought to concentrate more on what society says it wants from them, and as for the teachers of science in the schools and universities, their business is to train people who will continue to satisfy those wants. That's a very dangerous statement, because culture is deeper than training. And if the culture and the education comes first, the training comes automatically. It must be seen in that way. Okay? We must look upon science and scientists as, as people who have a major contribution to our culture. The sort of thing that is happening is, uh, is changing some aspects of the way we do research. Here we see a statement, I am uncomfortable with the idea of blue skies research because it implies an activity with little sense of direction. Now the research I do is just looking into nature to see and try and understand it with no real view as to what applications and there's a whole range for those are applications areas and strategic science all the way to another area where you just say, well, this is interesting, let's find out what it does. And they are a complete part. They must not be separated. They must, be, must not focus just on one. You must do all of these. And today, there is a problem. Well, I'm this sort of person who does blue skies research, and I really would say that I do have some sense of direction, and that's to understand the way nature works. And there's something in the works of Tolkien, uh, which I, wonderful writer, and it was on the bumper of a Volvo in San Francisco, and that said, not all those who wander are lost. Mm -hmm. And I believe that is the statement which I like very much. Now, I'd like to say a few things about the way science is organized. Now, some, I was at the National Research Council, and there were one or two people who know of this organization, and this was the greatest research organization for physics and chemistry, probably in the 50s. And this was because the head of the research council, Stacy, had certain philosophical views on the way research should be done. I think I'll show you a few of these. Um, first, as he was implacably opposed to the concept of a scientist as the organization man. He valued in the scientist the qualities of individuality and independence. That is what, as teachers, we must generate in our students. Because they mustn't feel that you are right. I'm going to show you in what I'm going to say in the second part that one of the great aspects of having students is that they don't believe what I say. Okay. And it's very important because I discovered as I get older that even I don't believe what I say, so not my <laughs> today. Okay. Um, the committee and the team were to him the personification of woolly thinking. He, he abhorred, he resisted all the efforts at the bureaucratization of science and insisted throughout that the man was everything and the project was nothing. I'll give you some other parts. I can't do. Stacy Justice. He was a fantastic man. As these extracts make abundantly clear, he was implacably opposed to any attempt to formulate a broad, general plan for science. Okay, now this is the problem today. That governments and those who try to get value for money out of science, the problem is we don't know how to do it. Because 
the real science, the really important discoveries, are so surprising that you can't predict them. The most important advances are those that no one could, could foresee. And that's an important aspect. Here's another statement. Committees set up to advise on why general areas are of relatively little, little value in comparison with the committee of experts set up to advise on a particular problem in which they have special knowledge. Here's an important one too. I now look back at sometimes that I had to make decisions in areas which I really didn't understand. And I feel that I was really bad at doing that. Um, I think we've all been forced into that position. And in a, as a sense, <laughs> okay, I better, don't worry. <laughs> Making sure I get to my next lecture without them in disorder. I think it's important to realize that um, you really have to know what you're talking about before you give advice. And you may not particularly you may not give very good advice, but at least you know something about the subject. Okay? The worst thing is people who think that they understand science, know nothing, and formulate plans about it. And we'll come to that a little bit later. His article of faith, his articles of faith were that scientific establishments should be run by scientists, and that the organizations must be made to fit the man, and never the man the organization. And above all, that administrative considerations must never be allowed to dominate. Now this has changed. Because as money has got tighter, it's been much more difficult for governments to allow scientists the freedom to follow those areas that they want themselves, which do not appear to have some direct benefit for society. And we'll come to one or two arguments of that kind, as I say, a little bit later. Polanyi, uh, this is the father of John Polanyi. Michael Polanyi uh, was at Manchester, a, a brilliant scientist, his son uh, also. Like Polanyi, he believed in the spontaneous coordination of independent initiatives and the exercise of those informal mechanisms which traditionally have been used by academies, the scientific meeting and the expert committee. I like this, the spontaneous coordination of independent initiatives, because the discovery of C60, which is really the reason that I'm here, was one such spontaneous initiative, as you, as you shall see. Now, what I would like to do is finish this major introduction with what I think is an example of the sort of research that I think is becoming much more difficult to do at the present time. And yet, I think all of us will see it as being one of the greatest contributions to society of recent years. Here is an actual and far more typical case. Some people decided to examine the effect of an electric field on living cells. They generated this field between two platinum surfaces immersed in a liquid culture medium. The cells died. But the people who did the experiment were real scientists who resisted the obvious conclusion and found that the cells were not being killed by the electric field, but poisoned by tiny traces of dissolved platinum. They mentioned their finding to a colleague who looked for and found a stronger effect in cancer cells. A search in the chemical literature for soluble compounds of platinum turned up a substance that had been made nearly 100 years ago by a chemist in another country whose interest was simply to explore platinum chemistry. Platinum chemistry was very difficult. But that's what scientists are. They said, this is difficult. I'm going to solve it. I'm going to look into this. Okay. This compound was even more effective against cancer cells. In the event, a large number of people are alive today who would be dead, but for the constructive but unfocused curiosity of several scientists separated by discipline, nation, and time. The factors combined in this success were curiosity, skepticism, good communication, and publication of results. Together, these produced an outcome that nobody predicted or expected, and that is the essence of research. 
But it has always been difficult to persuade those who finance research that predictable results are worthless and that the best hope is to employ the team that makes the vital connections between other people's results and sometimes their own. Now, let me give you another example, one that you're all familiar with. In 1870, Reinitzer was looking at a liquid, and he noticed that when light passed through it, there was a problem. It, it, as you shake water, it's no problem, but if you shake some compounds, you see a shimmering effect, something like the way that light is um, refracted as it passes through the air over the surface of a hot road. And that was the start of an understanding of liquid crystals. From there, at that time, there was not a very good understanding of molecular molecules. From 1870, people started to understand how George Gray developed the compounds that we see now in these, dis in these displays. What had to happen for that to occur? Well, one thing, you had to have microprocessors, transistors, materials, an understanding of molecules, synthesis of compounds of a particular kind. The synthesis of molecules that could be oriented in the electric field and the development of batteries. So over a period of 100 years from the origins of a project, we said, gee, what's going on in here? Looking at blue skies through this liquid to today. That was a type of research where we see it took 100 years for that original research to bear fruit. My view is at the present time that we must safeguard in parts of our universities the research carried out by youngsters who are brilliant, but are not the sort of person that can tell them what to do. They just have a fascination and a curiosity with the behavior of materials. And out of that, they're particularly interested in something that no one else might be interested in, but they develop an understanding, and maybe 10, 20, 30 years later, there is some major application of that study. Okay. So that's, I think, the first part of my presentation. Uh, I want you to think about it. And the next part, I'll talk about my, my research. Now, if you wanted to make some comments on... Uh, the comment is coffee break. So, <laughs> uh, so that everybody can have a chance to digest what you have just introduced, and then we'll go to the meat of the matter. Uh, Take a coffee break, huh? synthesis uh, was interesting, but also what we call the spectroscopy was interesting. I'll just show you a picture of this. I don't expect you to analyze it. But here we'll see the molecular formula for a molecule with five carbon atoms. That was synthesized by an undergraduate 
at the University of Sussex in the mid-70s. And then radio astronomy became very important. And it was possible, by using a radio telescope, to look in the space between the stars and show that space between the stars was not empty. It was full of molecules. And here is a signal of this molecule with five carbon atoms from the constellation of Sagittarius. Now, let me show you a picture of the sky. What we see here are masses of stars. But it's very clear that there are parts of the sky which are black, where there are no stars. Now, the old picture by the Greeks was that the, the stars were diamonds, and the diamonds were stuck in a glass dish. And this glass dish was supported by Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? He was holding this glass dish. And he was standing on turtles and tortoises. And um, these black areas were holes because a Liverpool football supporter had thrown a brick through this glass dish, and there's a big hole there. Now, we know that this is not the case. We know it was an Everton supporter that actually, <laughs> actually threw it through there. Uh, I've learned some of the interests of uh, so, uh, our uh, uh, ambassador here. I think he's an Everton supporter. It's a bad time for Everton at the moment, yeah. But don't worry, I'm a Bolton Wanderers supporter, and they're, they're lower than Everton are at the moment. Anyway, um, these inter areas were really quite interesting, because, of course, the first thing you look at are the bright stars. But chemists, they always look in the dark areas. And this is actually where all the important chemistry goes on. And if those areas weren't there, there would be no new stars, and there would be no new planets, because deep in these black clouds that are in front of the stars, more chemistry goes on in space than ever goes on in planets. And in fact, that chemistry leads to molecules which aggregate to form planets. And all the chemistry, all the carbon in your body is produced in these areas. Well, to cut a long story short, we detected a whole set of these molecules here is a radio astronomy signal for a molecule with nine carbon atoms. So you take a radio telescope, and instead of pointing at a satellite, you point at the black areas, and you can see the signal of a molecule which is rotating. And it gives out a radio signal. Now, I'd like to show a picture from that time, in the mid to late 70s, of a space find. And the reason for showing it is that I used to have some hair. All right. Uh, just to convince you. Uh, the other thing is there were three astronomers, not Lorne Avery, Norm Broken, and John McLeod. And Lorne Avery never had any hair ever, even when he was born. Uh, and Takeshi Oker, uh, fantastic scientist now in Chicago, and we got together to do this. Now, by the end of the 70s, uh, it was quite clear that in those black clouds, in some of those black clouds, there were some interesting carbon chain molecules. And the reason they were there is because certain carbon stars had blown up and smeared the carbon out into space. And um, I'll show you a picture of these. This is a particular star. It's a shell. And this is a very large shell. The star has blown this material off. It's blown up. And our own star the sun will do this one day. And the shell is bigger than the solar system. Our star will blow up, but it'll be quite some time. It'll be 5,000 million years, all right? I don't plan to be around that, <laughs> long, that long, actually. Uh, and so it's, you know, I'm not going to worry about it. But this plasma is really quite interesting because what happens in a star is that hydrogen is squeezed to helium, okay? So four protons are squeezed into, into helium, gives you the number four. And three helium nuclei are squeezed into carbon to give you 12. And four are squeezed into oxygen to give you 16. And so, these stars are where you were really born. 
your atoms were born in this star. So this is basically mother, all right? You may not realize it, but this is your mum. True. Okay. Now, as luck would have it, in 1984, at Easter, I visited Rice University, where Rick Smalley had invented a technique which had revolutionized what we call cluster science. This is really, perhaps, the only really technical picture I would show. It's very interesting. Here is a valve which opens and shuts. And the helium passes down this channel, and it's about one millimeter wide, so it's a tube. When the helium, as it opens and shuts, a pulse of helium passes to, when it passes to this point, a laser fires and is focused on this disk, which was aluminium. And a plasma comes off the disk, it's like a magnifying glass, sudden pulse of light, it heats this disk up at that point to 10,000 degrees, and you produce a plasma of atoms which go into the helium and are cooled and are blown off into the vacuum. And so you produce 60 aluminium atoms, or 70 iron atoms, or 100 sort of silicon atoms. And that had never been done before, to produce a gas in which you produced a small number of metal atoms and refractory materials. And I thought, well, if we make this disk graphite, maybe the plasma would be similar to the plasma in a carbon star. Maybe we could simulate the chemistry in a carbon star. And that was interesting to my colleague, Bob Curl, who had invited me to, to that. And here I'll show you the plasma. This is actually a plasma coming out of the nozzle. So imagine this at this particular point, okay? And there's the plasma coming out, and it passes through this funnel into what's called a mass spectrometer. Now, don't worry about that. All that tells you the mass spectrometer it tells you how many atoms you, you have. So you can get an idea of how many are stuck together. So I suggest let's make this plasma carbon. And let's see whether we can see these carbon chain molecules. Can we simulate the conditions and so produce the carbon chain molecules which we detected? Well, as luck would have it, in uh, August 1985, I got a call from Bob Curl to say, come to Rice University in Texas to do this. And when I got there, I met these two fantastic students. On the left is Jim Heath. And on the right, Sean O'Brien. And you can see we're hard at work. We're drinking Coors and Budweiser and eating Spanish. There you go. They're ringing me to tell me it wasn't Coors, it was actually. Okay. Um, but anyway, and also Yuan Liu, who was now back in the States, Chinese student. These are the three students who really knew how to do it. Now, one thing you students will realize when you do research, is that you do all the work, and the professor puts his feet up and sits there and takes all the glory. Okay, I'm sorry, that's the way it is. Anyway, but then when you become professors, you take over and you get your own back. Okay. Now, let me just say that here is the wonderful result that we obtained um, on the 4th of September, 1985. It's Nothing very difficult. This is signal here, which I hope you can see, is the signal. It says this is a species with 10 carbon atoms. We just count it. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Okay. Now, here we see six carbon atoms. Okay. That's a well-known structure. Any chemist, physicist, even some physicists would know this. <laughs> even some ambassadors would know that this is benzene. Okay. And the point about it is, that's how we would expect carbon to actually be constructed. So we look through this, but we don't see the number six, okay? Because that's the conventional picture. What we discovered, to our great surprise, and to everybody's surprise, is that here, you can count it up, okay? So 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 15 19, 23, and these we get to around 30s, and then we get to 60. This was a signal which was off scale. There was something special about the number 60 for carbon. Now, if you look at the textbooks, this is the picture of graphite. And it's hexagons, a sheet of hexagons like this. So if we'd seen six, that would be good. 
Now also, just to show you that not only I had noticed this, but the students as well, because they were smart students, they would seen it as well. I hope you can see this. C60 and C70 are very strong. These are all three students. C60 is very large, and why C60? They've been writing in their book. And here's another lesson. If you see something, write it up. Because one day it might be important. And this was an important page. Now then, I was staying with my friend Bob Curl, and this is the floor of his washroom. Okay? <laughs> now, it's a very important floor, because every morning, I would sit and look at this floor and say, what is so important about it? And we see the number six is important. But we look at this, and here if we look at this, the number six is nothing in there. Okay? So that's something wrong. And we're like that child in that first picture, right? We've got something. We've got to try and fit it into a pattern. Well, to cut a long story short, we thought that somehow it might be a sheet of hexagons like this, which is what graphite is. Something like that. A big sheet which had curved into a dome like this picture from Montreal. And if you look, you can see this. You see the sixes? Somehow, Bob Mr. Fuller had turned this into a cage. The second thing is that some years beforehand, I'd made something for my children, which is shown here. And the interesting thing, it, it turns out it's a map of the sky. And it's on a truncated icosahedron. And this was back home, and I think, well, should I call Margaret up? But it's, you know, like 3 o'clock in the morning. And we discussed it. I said, well, you know, look, it's not only just got hexagons, it's got pentagons as well. And that night, Rick cut out some hexagons and tried to make a ball. But it wouldn't work. And then he remembered that I said, well, you know, there are pentagons as well. And once he cut out some pentagons, something very interesting happens. And I'm going to show you what happens here. Uh, I, if you put these and put a pentagon in there, okay, and now join that up like this, you can see what happens is the sheet starts to curve. Okay? And that's a fundamental law of topology and mathematics. Okay? You cannot close a sheet of hexagons without some other structures. And if you have pentagons, it turns out you need 12. And 5 times 12 is 60. And so you get the magic of the soccer ball. And the next morning, Rick came in with this picture here, this beautiful model. And it was the same structure, and it was right. And we were so excited. Well, the question now is what, to, what should we call it? Well, I told them we must call it after Buck Mr. Fuller and call it Buck Mr. Fullery. Now, I don't know whether this is difficult to say in time, okay? I know it's not so easy in all languages, but it's very easy in English. And you may not like the name, but if you don't like the name, you do have an alternative. And it's the UPAC name, which is shown here, okay? <laughs> now, I understand there's a UPAC conference going on, and you're here. And they're there, all right? So I'm sure we're having a ha better time because they're having to memorize formulae like this, and we're just having to be able to say Buck Mr. Corey. Okay, well, what I would like to show is this picture of the football team. In the middle is Bob Girl, Rick Smalley, myself, and of course the two students who did most of the work. We get the prize, and they just you know, they have to suffer a little bit, right? But there you go. They've got some really good jobs. Jim is a professor now at UCLA, and Sean is working for Texas Instruments, making the best conductors. Right. That's the story up to 1985. A little bit of the story. It's a serendipity as far as I'm concerned. Serendipity is you discover something which you didn't expect, and it's a nice, nice thing. However, it would have been discovered, it's not a serendipity for science, because it would have been discovered within a year. It's very fortunate that I was involved. I believe that Rick's apparatus would have uncovered C60 within a year. It was very fortunate that I, Rick, and Bob, and the students actually were involved in this beautiful discovery. The question now was how to prove it, because we just got the number six, Steve, and we said this is it. Well, 
I can't go into it, it's a long story, between 1985 and 1990. But suffice it to say that we made a simple carbon arc with two carbon rods, and you put a welder across it. We've got a local school, and 14, 15, and 16 year old kids are doing this now. It's amazing. Very straightforward. And we put a bell jar across the top and put argon in here, and we studied this, and I made a fundamental error. And that was, I thought C60 would be formed, but I thought it would be in such small amounts that I would need the most sensitive apparatus to detect it, a mass spectrometer. Turns out it was a bit, I'd already been, we'd been making it in one to five percent yield. Just shows you, you can never predict these things. But as luck would have it, uh, about three, four years later, working with Jonathan Hare, who's shown here, there's a carbon arc, there's a bell jar. One or two other things have happened. We discovered that there was an interesting result by a group, by Kretschmer and Hoffman. I'll come to them in a minute. Fantastic piece of work. But one day, Jonathan put this on my desk. He put a, a little red solution. And I looked at this red solution and said, this is pure graphite. And it's soluble. It's almost un impossible to believe. Now, if you had a diamond ring and you're washing something up and it dissolves away, you would be pretty irritated, right? <laughs> and whoever bought you the ring would be even more irritated, right, if it dissolved and disappeared. A graphite. You can put graphite into almost anything. It will not dissolve. This was almost impossible. But Jonathan really believed that this was C60. And this is the way youngsters have this optimism. And he gave it to this is C60. Because we discussed whether C60 would be soluble or not. Anyway, that was on a Monday. And I thought, well, maybe, but we must be very careful. And then, on the Thursday, we tried to do some NMR to show that it was C60. Now, the interesting thing about this molecule, let me tell you, how many of you know about magnetic resonance? Put your hands up if you know something about magnetic resonance. Well, some of you know about magnetic resonance imaging, right? Which you can hold body imaging. But magnetic resonance is, has a deeper picture because it's nuclear magnetic resonance, and every atom is equivalent, and therefore, in what's called the magnetic resonance spectrum, there should be a single peak. If you had a molecule with two types of carbon atoms, it would have two peaks. And if it had three different carbon, it would have three peaks. But this amazing molecule, they're all the same, and so it just have just a single peak. So we tried that, but we didn't get a result. The next day, I got a call from Nature. That's the journal. And um, they... Uh, <laughs> Pretty good, okay, right. <laughs> they, 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 this is on Friday, and uh, they said, uh, would you referee a paper by Kretschmer? And Kretschmer and Hoffman had done a very, very interesting piece of work a few months, well, maybe six months, or published six months earlier, and had got us back on track to, to, to look again at our results, because their results implied they'd seen something interesting. Well, that was... Some, Friday morning. At 12.05 on Friday came this volume of facts. Solid C60, a new form of carbon. And this paper was bad news. Because in there, it was a fantastic picture. These were crystals of C60. It turns out that if you just let this solution evaporate away, you get crystals. <coughs> All you need to do is take a carbon arc, put a welder across it, under argon, collect the soot, put the soot in benzene, let the soot evaporate off, and you get these beautiful pictures. I believe this is one of the most important pictures of chemistry and materials of the 20th century. It was a fantastic paper. I rang up after lunch and told the editor to accept this paper. It's a wonderful paper. Congratulate Kretschmer. And I, well, it wasn't, it was before I thought, you know, I said, you know, well, what should I do? Should I commit suicide? Because <laughs> it wasn't, you know, here was a resolution, they got it there. Or should I go for lunch? Now, there are one or two people who have been at Sussex, and they know that there's not a lot of difference between going, 
<laughs> and seriously, I'm going to lunch, you know. Uh, and, uh, but that's the same at any British university, you know. Uh, but I've had Thai food, it's not the same here in Russia, it's no doubt about it. Um, anyway, I looked at an answer, what to do about this? And um, there's a red solution, it was a fantastic paper. And I think that had the, it, the Nobel Prize could only go to three people. I feel extremely fortunate, I'm a good scientist, and there's some fantastic scientists who will never win the prize, okay? Uh, but Kretschmer and Huffman did a fantastic job. The more I look at what they did as the best students, the more admiration I have for them. And I think if it could have gone to more people, could have gone to five, I'm sure they would have been co-winners. Anyway, as, uh, as it happens in the afternoon, I think, what to do now? But we had actually extracted it and I thought, well, maybe we can get the NMR spectrum. We could just recoup a little bit. We could come in second. And coming second to that paper was really something worthwhile. And my colleague, Roger Taylor, said he would help us. And he discovered that if you take the red solution, participate down a chromatographic column, which you can do again in schools, it separates into two solutions, one magenta and one red. And the magenta solution gives a single line NMR spectrum, and the red solution gives a five line spectrum of a molecule with seven carbon atoms. Now it turns out that a couple of these overheads are not there, but that was it. They, this was the crucial thing. It was possible to make enough C60 to do the NMR, and now we work with it. Before going on, let me say that the molecule had been thought of by A.G. Osawa in 1970, and in a book on aromaticity by Osawa and Yoshida, we see down here, we see C60. So there was an imaginative piece of work which predated our discovery by 15 years. And it's important to realize that. I'd like to say a few things now. I've talked about the discovery in 1985. I've talked about the extraction which was crucial to actually prove that our structure was right, because we didn't have proof. It was circumstantial, we, we just believed it to be right. It was so beautiful, I remember thinking, well, it doesn't matter whether it's right or wrong, everybody would love it, you know? And they do. But I thought we'd better be right as well. I mean, it was... Uh... Now, let me give you a few uh, pointers about the chemistry. The chemistry is very interesting. What we can see here is the NMR spectrum of this molecule, which is C60Cl6. You can add groups to it. In the case of chlorine, you can add four of those, uh, six, six chlorine atoms. And you can make not only the molecule with six chlorine atoms, but also one with eight. Now what I'll do is I'll do this. If you take this pentagon, you can add a group like this, Take each pentagon, okay, and go one bond out from the center, okay? So I'll, well, I'll do this. It's a nice, easy chemistry, right? You see, because you just take this model and you put it on there like that, and you put it on here like this, and another one on here. Now, it adds, but you need to add an even number. So you can add five benzenes to it, and I'll put a hydrogen on there. And now you've got a, mo a molecule, it looks like a, an animal, with five legs, right? And uh, Paul Burkett, so far, has only made the male of the species, right? Uh, I'll let you pass that round, because that is one of the most interesting compounds. And we can sit this on a surface, okay? And the future will be that these molecules will sit on the surface and will take electricity, electrons into it, and store electrons on these molecules in the next area of molecular electronics. This is a very interesting area. One of my favorite compounds is the molecule that I call the Star Wars compound. Now here is the Death Star chasing perisine, okay? Um, Spielberg has asked me for the copyright on this molecule, for the future of molecular <laughs> Wars, right? Now, we can see this here as these little 
spaceships are passing between the planets. You can do many other things. Here is one, again, by Paul Berger, one of the wonderful workers at Sussex, who's made a hole in C70. This is an 11 carbon atom hole. And the future is to do chemistry and put atoms on the inside of C60. And that is now a major area of study. Here is the molecule that's being passed around. These are the phenol groups. And we can look at them on a surface. It turns out they don't sit on the feet. They actually fall over. They've been drinking too much. Uh, here we see them arrayed. And in fact, they're like shuttlecocks on the surface. We know that. And the future will put hydroxyl groups and make them sit up so that we can develop their applications, as I say, in molecular electronics. Well, there's a whole load of chemistry, which I'll just show you here are some pictures. There are now something like 13 to 14,000 papers on C60. They're running now at something like 2,000 a year. And it's still increasing. That is the synthetic chemistry, and at Sussex we have a, a fullerene science centre, which David Walton is the director, um, and we not only do that, but we do what's called nanotechnology, and I would like to now spend a few minutes talking about that area, um, which is another, another book, number three. We're going to do about you know, another five hours, I've got plenty more books here, so you don't, don't worry, so but I'll just talk a little bit about this, because what I would like to show you is that here is a carbon arc, and if you run the carbon arc, but don't look at what comes off it, but look at the cathode, there is a growth on the cathode here, it's, a, it's seven millimeters across, it's almost like a pie, hard crust. If you scrape out the center and look with an electron microscope, what you get is a structure like this. Now this is a graphite tube. The images under the electron microscope look like this. And it's, you see just the edge. Okay, so it's looking just through the edge. The electron microscope passes through and you only see the position around the edge where the atoms are lined up. Okay? And these were observed first by Sumio Ishima at NEC. And here is a picture of the nanotube. Now, I called these a zeppelin when I first found one. <laughs> Students are the same all over the world. Now, it's very interesting because Buckminster Fuller had actually designed not only the domes, but also these tubes. Okay, so it's very nice that these are called Bucky tubes. Well, I don't want to go into too much detail, but you can make these in many ways. And I have some wonderful students who have actually made these things. And here we see, it, I mean, it looks like a, a spaghetti, right? And, uh, but we want to actually um, make these so that they're straight. So I wanted to grow these out of a substrate. And what we got was this. And we, this doesn't look too good. We, I want them straight. And one of the students, Mauricio, said, well, why don't we do it upside down? And then they will hang down and they will grow straight. I said, oh no, gravity is not. But you see, the good thing about my students, they don't take any notice at all. From where, you know, and they do what they want. And believe it or not, they do hang down straighter. There you see. So well, the one thing about students is that nine times out of 10, the professor's right. But the 10th time, they're right. And that's the crucial time. And the most important thing is to have students who basically don't believe anything you tell them, right? And they do these crazy experiments. And it's the really crazy experiment that no one would actually think of, which is the most important one. The most important thing is not to blow themselves up. Otherwise, the professor goes to jail. That's the problem, you know. But uh, so you just make sure you don't do anything that crazy. Right. Um, there are a lot of things I would like to sh say, um, but I, I don't have the time. I think um, I'll, I'll mention one particular experiment which is Wen Kuang Su from Taiwan. And he discovered that if you take a carbon crucible, just make a piece of carbon, and put some lithium chloride in it, 
and put an electrode in it and do electrolysis. Almost the same sort of electrolysis as in a lithium fluoride battery, really. Then you get nanotubes. So these tubes form, and here are these things, and they're quite long and they're quite beautiful. Now let me tell you why these are important. These nanotubes are something like a hundred times smaller than modern carbon fibers. A mosquito has the advantage of scale. So if you take a mosquito and it carries a lump of sugar on its back, it's the equivalent of a tank. These fibers are a hundred times smaller than modern carbon fibers. They have a strength between 50 and 100 times that of steel. They are one-sixth the weight, and they can conduct like copper and aluminium. The future is fantastic. At the present time, we can only make them in milligram quantities. Let me show you an important picture. Jonathan Hare, a wonderful student working with me, has pointed out and this is a nice picture. I call this Hare's ratio. It's the last fundamental constant in the, of physics. The ratio of the size of C60 to a soccer ball is the same as the soccer ball to the Earth. It's a factor of basically 10 to the 8, or 1 over 100 million. Not only that, if you make these with bends, you can make like these apparently can behave like electrical switches. Not only that, they bend like tubes. If you've ever had a bicycle and you've fallen off it or an elephant fell off it and you went to the thing, then it bends. Okay? So does the elephant's trunk, as I discovered in Chiang Mai. Now the interesting thing is if you look at this, here we see that under the electron microscope, this thing bends. But if you look at a normal carbon fiber, what happens is it breaks. But some of them have got a nanotube in the center. You crack the carbon fiber and out of the center comes this nanotube. Now if we can stack these nanotubes together, we will have the strongest material of this. You will be able to build airplanes 10 times lighter and 50 times stronger than the airplane today. They will be so light that even if the engines fail, they will glide. They will not break up. The future is tremendous for civil engineering. The challenge is there. We can possibly build skyscrapers that will not fall down, and bridges that will not fall down in earthquakes. For civil engineering, it's a tremendously exciting possibility. However, can we do it? I don't know the answer to that. But there's some youngsters there who I know are going to solve this problem. But I tell you one thing, it's too hard for me. And you've got to be, you're, I'm sure that all you guys and all the others I met earlier are going to be much smarter than me. It's a very exciting time, and I'm looking forward to surviving that long. Here are some of Buckminster Fuller's patents. You can see he's got them there. And I'm going to finish now with something which I think is important. How many here had what we call Meccano. Any time, is there a time Meccano? No? Well, here is something from 1928. It turns out that this kit, many, many students and kids in Britain had what we call Meccano. Um, yeah, I think it's responsible for engineering capability up to 1950. And the reason that we don't have any engineers now is that we don't have an economy anymore. But the interesting thing is that in 1928, Mr. A.H. Finlay of Hollywood County Down sent this in. It says, no doubt our readers will find several possible uses for this novel sphere. It turns out that this kit, many, many students and kids in Britain had what we call Meccano. Um, yeah, I think it's responsible for engineering capability up to 1950. And the reason that we don't have any engineers now is that we don't have a condo anymore. But the interesting thing is that in 1928, 
Mr. A. H. Finlay of Hollywood County Down sent this in. It says, no doubt our readers will find several possible uses for this novel sphere, but we do not consider that it would form a very suitable football. It's amazing. It took another 30, 40 years before that structure was used for the soccer ball. However, you know, Britain, England isn't doing too well at soccer nowadays. But if we were using this one, our cloggers would win the World Cup. There's no doubt about it. <laughs> the only ones that have got feet that are so hard that we wouldn't be able to feel it, right? Well, with that, I'm going to stop the second part and uh, we'll go on to the third part after, I guess, a little break. For another coffee, maybe. <laughs> Uh, I guess maybe not coffee. <laughs> I think uh, it's so interesting that many uh, listeners here probably would have a lot of questions to ask. Maybe we'll go for five, ten minutes for Q&A. Okay. Uh, please feel free let your heart, your mind, your mouth open and ask questions. I always say to many of my friends, the person who asks the right question is a smart person. So, Buddha asked himself why people get old, get sick and die, and then he became enlightened. So ask yourself another question, maybe you can win the next Nobel Prize. So go ahead, please. You can ask either in Thai or it is wrapped into a tube. And here we see that it's essentially a helical conformation. There are two different structures. One's called the zigzag structure. If you took a sheet of graphite and turned it into a, a tube, and an armchair structure, and these two will have different electrical properties. These are very interesting, and a lot of interest in the possibility of using these in nanoscale switches in molecular electronics. And also, the, the most recent studies are fascinating. These are quantum conductors. These are, these are carbon wires, um, and they're smaller than any metal wire is likely to be, because the metal doesn't hold together. We might, um, and uh, there's one here. We can make nanotubes, which are actually helical. And this is very interesting because in the future we might be able to make, um, I'm not sure I can find it, but we, there are some structures in which we can actually make the carbon tube or carbon uh, fiber, which is already wrapped as a multiple helix. We can have double helices and triple helices, but we can't control it. We discovered that they form, they self-assemble, and there may be a catalytic particle involved, and if we can discover the mechanism of that self-assembly, then I think we'll have a way to make incredibly strong fibers. Okay. But um, again, this is a problem for the youngsters. They're engineers, so there are seven engineers, I think, here, and they're all gonna solve this problem, right? Yes? Why 60 can't be 40? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, I couldn't, you know, in the time available, explain everything, but it's something to do with the fact that it's a soccer ball. Okay? Now, it turns out, from Euler's Law, okay, which with a bit of luck I'll try and find, because I'm not, I think I've seen the page I need, um, because this is a bit of mathematics. Don't worry, this is so simple. Don't worry. Um, I find that the people who really understand this best are five-year-olds. Um, they're, they're much better than I am at this. Um, before I finish, I'm going to show you the triple helix. I'm going to just digress for a second. This is one of my favorite pictures. We've got a triple helix there. It's a very big tube, but it shows that triple helices can be, can be uh, catalyzed, and there's a metal particle right at the top of here. Right. Now, let me tell you this, because I use this with youngsters. It turns out that there's an expression which is very simple. It's 12. Is it, you see it's 3, 2, 1, 0, minus 1, 2. 
If I just take it to six member grains and five member grains, we see that if I want to make a network which closes, okay, a closing network which involves six member grains, if I don't have any five member grains, we get a, an equation which just has no solution, okay? Zero times n six. So it turns out you cannot close a cage with hexagons alone. If you take the Euler expression and you allow pentagons, then zero times this, this disappears, and the number of five membered rings is 12. And you think, ha, ah, five times 12 is 60. So the first structure with pentagons alone that like can close is the dodecahedron, okay, which is, it passes, discovered that. That is 12 pentagons. And they're all together. Now, if you're a chemist, and there are many chemists here, they know that it's very hard to put two pentagons together. Two hexagons together gives you naturally. Two pentagons together. That's a very rare compound. So the secret is to put 12 pentagons together so they're, but they're not side by side. If you then have a system which has 12 pentagons, and none of, none of them are what we call a butting, or side by side, I think you can see the first solution is C60, because they're all separated, because then you must have 12 pentagons, none of them are side by side, and so 5 times 12 is 60. The first time that Euler's law is satisfied, and all the pentagons are separated, is the C60. You get it? I don't think that that's all there is to it. And so it's the first structure which is stable according to our known organic chemistry, and that satisfies Euler's law. There are those small ones, and I believe we've seen them, but they are extremely unstable, and you cannot isolate them. They appear in what we call the beam, but then they grow into C60, which is the first stable one. Is that okay? That's the best I can do, and I may not be right, but it's just, it, that's the present thinking on that. So it's a very good question. And a nice example of simple topology. Okay? I guess the scientist's father was a watchmaker. <laughs> 60 seconds makes a minute. Yes, uh, yeah, it's uh, right. <laughs> Next question. Yes, um, those, uh, can you repeat yeah, the question? Repeat that. Have there been band theory calculations carried out? I think there's been a lot of theory on the, this is really discussing things like the conductivity of these nanotubes. The problem in going down, let me just say, just mention it again, the problem in making wires at the very small scale is that the metals <coughs> don't stay together, okay? It's very difficult to make metal wires. But this compound is, has the strongest bonds that are known. And it's a molecule, it's a single molecule, okay? You can imagine that these, these, these tubes are single molecules, and single molecules have an identity. They have the structure and strength of a single carbon bond. And so the question now is, what are the electrical properties of these tubes? And the calculations can be done and the experiments are being done. And there are, if you keep track of, I think, a paper by my colleague, Rick Smalley, uh, last year in science, I think there's some, something in there. I think if you look that up, I think it was last year in science, there's a, there are uh, review papers on, on this particular topic. It's now, I think, the first experiments being carried out on the conductivity. And it's very difficult, because these can only be seen under an electron microscope. You know, this is difficult experimental stuff. You can't just take, you know, two little crocodile clips and stick them on the end of it. You can only see these things with the highest power uh, microscopes that exist. But it is now possible to do that. Very interesting. And the, the most recent uh, view is that they are what are called quantum conductors and have quantum me mechanical control of what's going on. Should we go on? Yeah, finish off. Yeah. 
How many minutes do you want? 15 minutes, 20 minutes? Okay, right, here we go. Time to finish. I'm going to now finish off with some things which I think are, uh, I think are as important as the discovery of C60, but also as important of, as what I said before. I've got another two hours here, but bits like I'm only allowed 10 minutes or 15 minutes, so I'll do it very quickly. Let me say a couple of things, and these are important. Um, this is what was in a newspaper, uh, 93. Accountants should not run British industry. My belief is they shouldn't run any industry. <laughs> it shows here companies run by people with scientific or technological qualifications do better than those run by accountants and financiers. This is the key finding from an investigation of 700 companies in Britain during 1990 by two economists, the University of Warwick. Yeah, many UK corporations are headed by chartered accountants. This strikes me as very curious. I do not believe they should be at the helm of British industry. I agree with that. Because science is a culture, and to understand what you are doing, you do need to be an engineer or a scientist and technologist. The second problem is this one. Can scientists shake off their mad media image? Okay. Now, I actually... I cut my hair before I came out to Thailand, you know, because I was doing so. But let me say that, you know, you all know what that, who that is, I think many of you. But look at this. This is a, who is responsible? Well, you know, I only wish that Einstein had cut his hair, right? Because then we would have had this image of being, I don't know, Harrison Ford or Robert Redford or, or, or um, there you go. Now, the problem is a serious one. Because when my, my discovery was made with Bob Kerr and Mick Smalley and the students, this was the picture I got into the local newspaper. And a student wrote, fantastic likeness, Harry, you see. And this is the caricature picture of the scientist. Now, all the scientists I know, none of them look like this. And the student who wrote this, I made him do an extra year for his PhD. For <laughs> anyway, that's the, that's the English newspaper. It turns out I was in Spain earlier in the year, and when I was there, year, in fact, Naomi Campbell was, was over here. They didn't show her on that particular picture. Um, now, however, joking apart, I think this is a problem that faces us. Simon Jenkins in the Times wrote, for example this year the Times published a major article to the effect that the national curriculum puts a quite unrealistic emphasis on science and mathematics which few of us ever need. Now I think that's the most dangerous statement I've ever seen made because I'm sure that every time that person walks into a room and switches on the light he doesn't realize that he's using basically science and technology. That is a really bad because our, our society today is so dependent on science and technology and that decisions are being made in which science and technology is being used injudiciously. It is absolutely vital that everyone is educated at least 50% in science and technology so that our governments and our civil servants and our uh, people who make decisions throughout the whole of society have an understanding of the way that materials, physics, biology is shaping the society in which we live. I'll give you an example. When we discovered the molecules in space, it came into the local newspapers, life's key may lie among the stars. And a student wrote that show is underneath. I made him do two years extra for his PhD for writing that. Uh, but anyway, it, it was in here and it said that they discovered proof that there are organic chemicals in some of the vast dust clouds between the stars. Here, the chemicals were discovered thanks to Canadian work in radio astrology. Okay. <laughs> That's the way it is in the newspaper. <laughs> now, the reason for showing you this is that science is a culture. I believe it's the dominant culture of the 20th century. And all culture has language. 
And let me tell you something about language. I'll start off with English, because it's really the only language I understand reasonably well, and it's hard for me to. I thought I, I one of my favorite statements recently. Although chemists were at the time limited by the time scale of flash lamps available, a race to study faster and faster reaction was, was just beginning. At a Faraday discussion meeting in Birmingham in 1954, called The Study of Fast Reactions, the German scientist Manfred Eigen asked the Oxford Don, Ronnie Bell, how the English language would describe reactions which were fast a little fast. Ronnie Bell said, damn fast reactions, Manfred. <laughs> and if they get faster than that, the English language will not fail you. You can call them damn fast reactions indeed. <laughs> now let me just tell you something. I come to, to Thailand, it's pretty hot, right? And I think it's pretty good because it's damn hot here. And I'm told that in this, when it gets really hot, it's damn hot indeed, right? So this is very good. Now, the reason of showing you this is that language is crucial. If I want to understand Thai literature, I will have to understand Thai. Um, I haven't got any Thai, but I thought I would show you this. Now, there may be some who can read this. Uh, this actually is Proto in, in Japanese, but it means expert in, in Chinese characters. Okay, so uh, Yang Qiu Zhu was working with me, another super postdoc at the moment, said I asked him, Yang Qiu Zhu to write this, and this is basically the hear no evil, speak no evil, see no evil. It's something that's in English as well. Now it turns out in Japanese, this is maybe readable to some. These are kanji characters. And it turns out that the three monkeys, the three is the symbol, hear no evil, speak no evil, see no evil. But in Japanese, saru, the second part, has a phonetic, or Japan, or China, or Britain. You have to learn the language. Now the same is true of science. And I will show a picture that any chemist will look at and say is one of the most beautiful molecules it's benzene. It's the pivotal molecule in chemistry. If I say to an Englishman, Hamlet, they will realize that that is a crucial, pivotal play, piece of literature, of English literature. It means as much to English literature as this molecule means to the whole of chemistry. This is an international language, however. The true international group of people are the scientists. Because they look at that, and I, they know what that is. You don't have to translate it. Now, the reason to, of saying that is that I think, I think what hits most is our jokes. Now, let me tell you this. This is a, a complex equation. But it turns out that even young children know how to solve that equation because this is what they have to do to cross the road. Okay? That's the equation. And I tell you, if you don't if you don't know how to do that in Bangkok, you've got a real problem. <laughs> now, let me show you another one, and I'm sure that not all of you will get this, but I hope that one day you will. John Maynard Smith was an aeronautical engineer. And Vip, you will love this one. Because Vip is but there are only there are two great joke tellers. Vip's one of them, and my, a Croatian friend of mine. They're two. They should, I'm going to get these two together because they will be non-stop joke tellers all night for 24 hours at least. Anyway, it turns out this is a true story. John Maynard Smith is one of our most eminent evolutionary biologists. He started off as an aeronautical engineer, and then moved into uh, evolutionary biology. You don't have to stay in engineering. You can move. That's the most important. To cross the boundaries. Don't say I'm going to be an engineer. I want to be. You want to be everything. Anyway, he had to write an article, and the article was asked. The, the, the editor said, "Look, don't put any equations in this article." So anyway, he wrote it, and he finally they decided he had to write this equation in. <coughs> and the editor looked at this and said, "You've got an equation in. I told you not to write any." And John said, yes, but I have to have this one. So the editor said, hmm, well, OK. You can have it, but you've got to simplify it by cross-multiplying the Ds. <laughs> now that is the thing that I tell you. The thing that hits deep of culture is the joke, right? If you understand the humor, if you understand that, you understand science. Now, 
I'd like to say a couple of things. The first thing is, with regard to C60, it's a beautiful molecule. But we should have known. We're pretty stupid, we chemists, right? Because here's a tortoise, okay? It knew that it had to have pentagons in there. Because if it didn't have a pentagon at the back, it would have a flat shell, right? And be bloody drafty up the backside, right? <laughs> Not only that, here is a fly. It's an Australian fly, an Australian fly. Yeah. 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 Right? You see this one? Flip it away. All right? Anyway, this fly, it's actually turned out that Jeff Goldblum was working as a postdoc for me, and he got stuck in the, in the, in the uh, electrodes, and he came out looking like this. Now then, what we see is the fly has eyes. Here's the hexagon, but it has to close. It has to have 12 pentagons, and if you look, sure enough, you'll find pentagons there, okay, and one here. It cannot do that with hexagons alone. If you look at the fly's eye, even those multiple components, you'll find at some point there's a hexagonal packing, but somewhere there's a pentagon. You look for it. Go have a, mic a microscope to see it. Anyway, uh, there are beautiful structures in nature. This is a silicious sea creature, and we see also these beautiful structures on there. If you look at the work of Albrecht Dürer, fantastic draftsman and artist, he was fascinated by these structures as well. Um, let me just finish off a couple of things before I go to the final version. Um, Vip, you like golf, yeah? The Park Royal Golf, a 56-sided ball invented by Willie Park during 1896, and if you look at it, you find somewhere there are pentagons here. Okay, so there was you find them, and if you look at the golf ball, you'll find that you can you'll find these hexagonal packings, but there you'll find a five-fold symmetry. So just look at it. There, there are many different types, but that's something. Now I'm going to finish off because I was in in Japan last year and gave a, a little talk to young kids in one of the museums and talk about C60 very much like I did here. Here, they are having a good time. I'm a, I'm a visitor at California in Santa Barbara, and here are some Hispanic kids, their English, English is their second language, and we're discussing these things, and they really enjoy talking and playing C60. And what I do with them is some mathematics. Here we have it. It's Euler's law, the basic law. The number of faces plus the number of corners minus the number of edges is equal to 2. Here we see Leonardo's drawings, and we look at the cube. The cube has 6 faces, so 6 goes in here. It has 8 corners, so 8 goes in. 6, six plus 8 gives you 14. And the number of edges, okay, it's 4 at the top, 4 at the bottom, and 4 around. That's 12. So 14 minus 12 is equal to 2. And I'm a typical professor. I do the easy one. I let the kids do the hard one, the homework, right? So I send them home to do that. And let them check whether that formula is right. And kids of the 6 and 7 and 8 can understand this. Okay? No problem at all. And that is mathematics. If they get, and suddenly it's getting, they just go and try and work, they get a... a a thrill out of coming up and finding, yeah, the number is two for the soccer ball. Not only that, people ask, well, there's no use for C60. Well, I'll tell you, these kids were silent for 30 minutes when they were making models of C60. And I tell you, every teacher in the whole world would tell you that is the most useful thing <laughs> I've ever come across, okay? <laughs> Here are these kids. I really love this guy. Just looking there, and he's making this. And at the end, they were, you see, they, they made the models, and we do workshops, not only in Santa Barbara, but also in Britain. And kids come into the University of Sussex and make these models, and they have a, a well of the time. Not only that, they use their imagination. Here, this kid's made a hat now that she sits me. And that was this sort of thing. Well, finally, I'm going to say that I'm involved in trying to make uh, science films for television. 
And I set up the Vega and Science Trust. If you want to check it up on the World Wide Web, it's www.vega.org.uk. And we're trying to build up a television channel, international one, only small beginnings at the moment, but I'm trying to sow the seeds so that, you know, if you've got a golf channel, and a, you know, all this other rubbish channel, it certainly should be that there should be a science channel on which real scientists are talking about what really turns them on. And we've made quite a lot of films. I'll give you an idea of the sort of films we've made. And in fact, we, last week, we may have had a first success that our films, which are shown on BBC2, have just been bought by Mexican television, so I'm very pleased about that. They're very inexpensive, and, uh, but they go into making more. We have by, on one on the origin of life, the chemistry of interstellar space. I forgot, don't know what that's about. Electron waves unveiled in microcosmos by Akira Tanamura. If you've ever taken a magnet and put iron filings around the magnet, you see the lines of force, yeah? What Tonomura, with the modern electron microscope, has shown the lines of force inside the magnet, because you can penetrate the magnet in a superconducting magnet. And it's, the pictures are like tornadoes moving through the magnet. It's fantastic in moving images. Nuclear power plant safety, what's the problem? A major issue, not on the 20th, but the 21st century, because at this stage, it's not clear that we have a solution to our power problems for the 21st century. We've got to think very carefully. We must make sure that if we have to use nuclear power in the 21st century, it is safe. I believe at the moment, we're not careful. The situation that we see in Russia, where Russian economy and society needs the energy, and therefore they are forced to use the Chernobyl reactors, which are unsafe. That could occur here and in everywhere else, where society has the demand for energy. And other countries may be forced to use unsafe technology. We must be very careful that that doesn't occur. Science and Fine Art, fantastic program where David Bumper of the National Gallery has shown how technology has looked inside paintings and shown what the techniques of the great artists has been. Jocelyn Bell Burnell discovered the pulsar. This is a student who made this fantastic discovery of a neutron star. The Crab Nebula blew up and left a star which was spinning in space. Self-assembly, nature's way to do it. Nanotube by Sumio Ishima. And most recently, the epidemic of mad cow disease in the United Kingdom. I believe this is our most important program because we're going to see in the future long period induction diseases. And decisions are going to have to be made before we know how dangerous those diseases are. And wrong and bad decisions were made because scientists were not able to say to a politician how serious this was going to be. And so politicians didn't take any notice. Now, we know from AIDS and we know from BSE and we know what's going to happen in the future. Nature's going to throw us some very difficult problems. And scientists are going to have to tell politicians, yes, we. It's going to take us five years to decide whether this is serious or not, but you better err on the side of caution. That's why I believe this is an important program. We've just made another set. Susan Greenfield on nuts and bolts of the mind. She gets young kids to pick up a brain. Now this may not, but you are what your brain is. This thing inside your head is you. And she discusses that. There Ain't Nothing Nowhere by David Miller. He talks to kids about the fact there is no such thing as a vacuum. There is nothing that has nothing in it. If you think about it, you take a, mag a, a comb and you pick up a piece of paper. There is something between the comb and you come to have the electric field. And therefore, how do you describe that? Young kids, they don't have a problem. They can talk about virtual photons. They can talk about the field in a way of ways of modern physics. So those are the sorts of things we're trying to do. We're trying to get films by scientists talking about science. Well, I'm going to finish with two things. The first is, in the House of Lords,
There was a question by Lord Errol of Hale, who asked Her Majesty's Government what steps they are taking to encourage the use of Buckminster Fullerene in science and industry. And the debate went like this, and it makes much more sense like this than it did if you actually separated it. But then, the next question was, Baroness Sear asked, My Lord, forgive my ignorance, but can the noble Lord say whether this thing is animal, vegetable, or mineral? <laughs> Lord Ray said, my lords, I am glad the noble Baroness asked that question. I can say that Buckminster Fluorine is a molecule composed of 60 carbon atoms known to chemists as C60. Those atoms form a closed cage, made of 12 pentagons, uh, and 20 hexagons that fit together like the surface of a football. And Lord Ray, my favourite question. My lord, is it the shape of a rugger football or a soccer football? <laughs> <laughs> and it turned out, no one knew the answer, but then suddenly, down from the chandelier came the only person who knew the answer. <laughs> uh, actually, I really love this guy. I, I just I feel the face, almost the whole of humanity is in this, this way. I, I, I empathize with, I, and I'm just <clears throat> proud that my DNA is only 1% different from this guy. Right? <laughs> I think it's about 10% different from the other guys around here. There, 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 there. But, um, my lords, however, what does it do? Well, they have to ask that question. My lords, it is thought it may have several possible uses, but batteries as a lubricant or as a semiconductor, but all that is speculation. It may turn out to have no uses at all. <laughs> and then, oh, Russell. My lords, can one say that it does nothing in particular and does it very well? <laughs> I had a tremendous time and I showed you a couple of things, but I must finish off with my last two overheads because they, they're about kids, because that's where I think the future lies. Because they've got to be smarter than we are. They better be. We've got to survive the 21st century. This is one of my favorites. Local school came to us, Dr. Lassie said, I'll read it down. New kid in town. Hi, I'm Diamond. I'm a kind of carbon. So am I. I'm graphite. We're the only carbon types there are around. And Ram, there's a new carbon in town, the Buckminster Fullerene. Right? <laughs> Bucky too, my friends. I'm carbon too, you know. Can't be. He's round. He looks like a football. We're better than him. And then, can you do this? And Bucky bounces. Kids are just turned on by this. And my fa favorite picture is this one. Anything that can do that with kids has got to be good. Thank you very, very much. Very much. I guess all of us are very fortunate that Sir Harry Croto uh, giving us his special lecture and bring something out of space down on earth and make it simple enough so that we can understand and uh, as for your information Sir Harry has been asked to lecture around the world in all the famous institutions and he has been booked up to the year 2000 so today we are very lucky that he can be here and give his lecture to all of us. Let's give him another big hand. <laughs> and on this occasion, I would like Professor Carol to present a small book uh, for Sir Harry to take home.